वेलकम वी आर प्रेजेंटिंग आर्टफुल हीलिंग कॉन्वर्जेशन अराउंड द हीलिंग पावर्स ऑफ द आर्ट्स आई एम अदिति बोरटकर एंड टूडे वी डेल्व इन टू अ डायलॉग ऑन द हीलिंग पावर्स ऑफ म्यूजिक विथ टू डिस्टिंग्विश्ड स्पीकर्स This conversation is powered by Women's Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industries National Arts Leadership Council. It is my pleasure to introduce our two guests today. I want to welcome Dr. Vasumati Badrinathan, the daughter of the great Padma Shishadri herself, Suramani Shringaramani, Padma Kala Sagara. Padma Bharata vocalist of the Carnatic classical tradition she is a performer and practitioner of carnatic classical music and also a scholar who has collaborated on numerous multicultural projects and written internationally a fulbright and erasmus mundus fellowship holder dr badrinathan it is our pleasure to welcome you today I also want to welcome Asta Lutra who's a clinical music therapist. She uses vocal music in the therapeutic setting to bring clinically significant changes in the persons she works with. She has experience working in schools, schools with special education, NGOs, cancer care neuro rehab and other clinical and hospital settings she is herself a singer and in parts music education to the ib curriculum schools i welcome you astha thank you aditi for all our soul sisters and audiences joining us on facebook today i want to request astha to share a little bit about what music therapy is and what her journey has been like in becoming the music therapist who works in clinical setups today so uh i believe i'm audible uh so when we talk about music therapy there lies so many things in india so we talk about music healing music therapy in a, a format where we say music listening and there is a research based practice so i work as a clinical music therapist in st jude child care center which is which is basically a care home for pediatric uh, oncology children who are undergoing the cancer treatment so we work with uh these little children and what basically music therapy is uh which uh actively basically supports the people to strive and improve their health functioning and well being so that is what exactly a music therapist do it is recognized internationally we are university trained professionals we are certified to be called as clinical music therapist and we have uh, drawn uh, on an extensive body of research so it's a research based work it's not that i like a song so i'm going to sing it uh, for you and it's going to help it is basically uh, where we work upon the research and the practices we follow so that is what exactly a music therapist is thank you thank you so much i'm sure our audiences uh, have gained from that understanding of the term music therapy and what goes into making of a music therapist in the clinical setting i want to uh, request dr badrinathan now to share a little bit about her journey because 
I know she has had a multicultural sort of experience and exposure and her work with music is enormous, enormous. Uh, I request you, ma'am, to share your journey with our audiences. Thank you. And also, thank, thank you, Aditi. How is... Uh, yes, please. You were saying something? Yeah, I, like I was just saying you. how... Yeah, how is it, how is it, uh, you know, uh, that the term music therapy sits with you as we begin today? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Aditi. Uh, uh, first of all, I would just like to start by saying that I'm neither a therapist nor a healer. I am a Carnatic uh, singer, and uh, my engagement is with Carnatic music, which is the classical music of South of India. So I perform, I uh, do a lot of collaborative projects, uh, I sing uh, in traditional kacheris, that is a regular uh, uh, Carnatic uh, repertoire concert. <clears throat> and uh, I write about music and I do uh, research based projects on music. So uh, that is uh, that is what uh, is my uh, engagement and connection with music. And uh, you asked me to uh, trace my journey with music. So uh, that began at, uh, from a very, very young age. I had the good fortune of being raised in a family. Uh, where there was music and the arts that surrounded me, knowledge, learning, all this was given a prime focus. Uh, my mother herself uh, was a singer. So I grew up listening to music all the time. Uh, either listening to her practice, uh, do her uh, rehearsals, her concerts, constantly thinking about music, the music books that were there, you know, visiting musicians that would come home. Uh, my father also was deeply interested in music. He was a great music lover. And he himself was learning the veena for some years. And uh, this was uh, the family milieu, the background in which I, I grew up, you know. Uh, almost every weekend we would go and sit in some concert hall listening to musicians. And uh, so I was intrinsically uh, drawn into it. Formally, I started learning uh, perhaps at the age of uh, four or five with my mother. And then little by little, uh, progressively, I graduated into becoming uh, a concert musician. And uh, I never resisted that. It just became a part of me because it was a part of me growing up. It was a part of my being. It was a part of uh, uh, the, the symbiotic uh, relationship that I enjoyed with music right from my birth, you know, that, uh, uh, that took me onto this path uh, very naturally. Thank you. And uh, I, I was just sitting with this question as you were sharing, you know, engagement with music from such a young age and especially in an environment when it was nurtured, so to say, you know, uh, it must have brought you in contact with a lot of other people like accompanying artists, audiences, organizers of these music shows so many teachers and colleagues. In your experience, how does music affect people? Uh, well, I'm yet to meet someone in my life uh, who says that uh, um, he or she is not touched by music. It is uh, that kind of uh, an art form <clears throat> that everybody connects with. It depends on the form of music, of course, uh, but everybody tunes up to music. That's why you have music, uh, you know, playing with uh, uh, advertisements and you have uh, music wherever you go, you know, whether it's the temple. So the chants also become, you know, uh, the incantations are musical. Uh, we have the Nama Sankirtana and everything. So you, music uh, per se, Everybody relates to it in some form of the other, whether they're able to articulate 
what that relationship is or how it touches them, that's another matter. But in some way or the other, everyone opens up to music, young, old, in between, everybody. So uh, I mainly uh, come in touch with the classical music audiences, which is a little more niche because, you know, classical music being classical music, it, it is codified. You have to have, uh, um, you know, some... Uh, some sort of an exposure to it and then you start getting into it and understanding the complexities of it uh, because it has its own grammar and it has its own you know intricacies that you have to understand and once you uh, start understanding that then you become what we call uh, a rasika or somebody who appreciates uh, the art form uh, so that audience of course you know you don't have to or draw them into music. They're already drawn into music. But I've also had complete novices, uh, people who have not had any sort of uh, deep connection with classical music also, who have come to uh, my concerts and have always opened up in a very positive way after listening to uh, uh, Carnatic Classical, the, my concert. So, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, I always feel that everybody has a space somewhere for the arts and them, which touches the, the very inner core. And you said it so appropriately, you know, it is the inner core which music touches. And it might not be from a place of talent or practice, but it's just that experience of listening to music, being in presence of music that is so uh, touching yeah absolutely yeah that, that that is what it is you know why do people listen to what they listen because they they derive uh, some happiness out of it they derive some sense of uh, a well-being out of it and they're happy being in that association you know of music so I think uh, that is what is uh, really most most important. Of course, that, uh, that perception will vary uh, from the point of view of who is looking at music, you know. So it's going to be different for the musician. It's going to be different for a layman rasika. It's going to be different for a music student. So it's, it's always different from the perspective from where you look at it. But each one opens up to music. Uh, there is no doubt about that. And something that I'm also uh, wondering now is, how does your relationship with music change over the years, you know? Is it different when you were younger? Because now you've been practicing music for such a, a huge part of your life. Undoubtedly, yes, Aditi. As you grow, you mature in your thinking, in your uh, reactions, and uh, the rapport that you develop with what you're engaging with. Therefore, as a child, you're still very raw. And uh, you've been told that you must learn and you learn and you go about it mechanically, but then you're imbibing and somewhere you are assimilating and it grows with you. So over a period of time as an artist, there is a certain transition, there is a metamorphosis and you're growing. It's always a, uh, a learning process for you also. And it becomes uh, so much an integral, intimate part of your being that you, you do not separate it from you. You know, it's there with you all the time. If I listen to, uh, for many, many years, I used to remain, I used to live uh, near the railway uh, tracks because my father was an officer in the railways. So we would live in a house that adjoined the railway tracks. All my growing years, I grew up with the sound of the trains. Whoever would come home would say, how do you live with this noise? But for me, that had ceased to disturb me. And there was rhythm, there was a pattern, and every uh, horn that blew out of the train had a certain pitch. And every train that went, there are different kinds of trains, you know. There are the trains that ferry people locally, there are the trains that take you outside the city, then there are the goods trains that carry goods, merchandise from one place to the other. And then there are the trains that run on the shunting tracks to practice themselves. So each of them has different sound, different meter, different rhythm, and I've written about this also. So you see, you, you perceive music uh, wherever you go. It's there in you. When I listen to the birds also, you know, I see the musical touch. And music is there in nature. Rhythm is there in nature. 
there's a certain order and beauty and power in nature. Uh, therefore, as an artist, you know, I, I look uh, very differently at music than what I did as a child or as an adolescent. Uh, there is so much of depth and profundity in music. There's so much capacity to touch you uh, in words and to help you realize uh, music in a far richer and deeper way than you ever did before. So I think, uh, yes, uh, it makes a lot more sense to me now than what it did before. And that is natural. As you grow, <clears throat> it warms up into you and you warm up to it. And what I'm also hearing is a lot about perception, growth, maturity, sensibility, and exposure. Asta, I want to ask you in, in your practice, uh, how do you see music having an impact on people in a therapeutic setting? Uh, so uh, when Dr. Vasumati was talking, I was wondering, these all questions are what we, we get when we are on the table. And uh, people come and tell us, I don't know music. I was never interested in it. I always loved reading a newspaper. I always loved uh, watching a Netflix show. I always loved playing cricket, but I don't know anything about music. So I am not doing it. Whenever they are recognized or called for therapy for any reason, these are the things which they bring up on the table. And when they bring these things up, then these are the small little things what Dr. Watsamati just said that we bring them up with. That, okay, fine. Any patient who ha just had stroke sitting on the window this, uh, has a railway track next to their uh, window. They literally can use that particular sound for their healing and to be better. So even with, when they do their physiotherapies, we ask them to use those little sounds to work upon their own life. That is where the music comes. And uh, when they talk about when, pe when we need to bring people down to that level of saying that, uh, okay, you don't know anything about music, which is absolutely fine. Even I don't like music at times. So I come out of it and bring them to the zone of sounds. You cannot say that you cannot feel sounds. You cannot think about sounds. You cannot listen to it. There are sometimes people who really uh, have issues listening to few sounds. We work upon those particular issues and bring those little things up and find out what exactly it is which matters to them. So this is how music therapy takes those little sounds and inputs from people and give it back to them and help them to relate to these little things and find out uh, what exactly and where exactly music can help. So uh, there was one of a patient of mine who was in comatose and the family introduced me by saying, he never uh, ever we have seen him listening to any sort of music. And uh, that was a Haryanvi old, tall, six two uh, person who was good enough and healthy enough. And uh, like, if you see him on a bed, he'll say, what exactly was the matter? There, when the family tells you no music, please leave the room, get out, find out something else, but no music. The first introduction to that was putting up a television and playing that Doordarshan tune, which really helped him to bring down and respond to that particular stuff and tell that, see, there is some of the other sound which is relatable. Even the way a, a news reader reads the news is some sort of tuning into it. it, has a pitch, has a rhythm, has a tempo into it. So that is what we relate to through music. And that is what helps them to uh, get into saying that, yes, music can help. Yeah, that's, that's beautifully articulated, actually. So it's more about uh, relating to music that's there in each of our lives and tapping into that somewhere. Yeah. 
that is one of a, and a, a that's one of a thing which we always try to do when we are doing when we say it's a clinical music therapy or a culturally centered music therapy yeah and i'm also wondering you know uh, like dr badrinathan was just sharing when uh, learns it out of interest and you know over practice and with technique mm, there are probably deeper philosophical underpinnings that one gets in touch with as they grow in a clinical setup uh, and i don't know if this question is appropriate but how do you bring that consistency or uh, how do you how does it play out is something that i'm just feeling curious about and i don't know if there is an answer or if this is a question that relates to your work uh so that gets to be very tricky because i myself was a hindustani classical vocalist and first thing my professor made me do is to come out of a zone of a singer and be a therapist because you will never get all music and music friendly and beautiful things in the room sometimes some will come and bang the wall and say this is music for me someone will come and bang a drum and tell you this is music for them so that is where uh, to unlearn to be in this profession is one of the biggest thing for a musician so whenever we get any interns who are highly uh, let me say on a caliber zones of musicians we ask them to be with children first because when they are with children they bring up all sort of sounds all together and being in a group of children this helps them to understand no all my good music is something which i need to put it outside and let let me see what are the sounds around me absolutely uh that that absolutely uh, gives me an idea about unlearning and unstructuring not just in 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 the way of getting in getting to relate to music but also in getting away from your patterns in a way right uh, that's also a major work that's happening in therapy uh in counseling setups absolutely yeah. and uh i want to uh, keep this space open now and ask both of you to maybe share maybe an example which it feels okay to share with our audiences to help them understand how has you experience healing through music if you ever have so who goes first <laughs> <laughs> uh, you of course you take it ma'am <laughs> <laughs> well uh, so i would word it differently i wouldn't call it healing but i would say that uh, you know there is a feel good factor about music and uh, this feel good factor is different coming from whichever uh, perspective you're looking from right uh, so for example if somebody cannot sing a note right or has never sung before and then tries and then feels very good because uh, she has achieved something if uh, someone wasn't getting uh, uh you know a song properly and has worked and worked and has now mastered that then you feel very happy about it uh, so each one can look at it differently uh for me as a musician uh the fact that it is such a very creative exercise uh by creativity i you know creativity is an, is a very important and integral part of uh, human existence so it's that special dimension which uh, we as human beings have and i think uh, uh many of us do not adequately tap this potential so when you achieve something creative so creativity is not about creating uh, a magnificent uh, painting or writing a book that uh, has never been written before a masterpiece or something like that creativity is bringing you your originality uh something very different to the way you approach things which can be absolute day to day mundane activities 
but you have to go out of uh, the the usual way of approaching things if you have a problem uh, with your electrical circuit or some some device in your house that doesn't work and x number of people have come and tried it and there's something there so you have to be very creative in finding out what the problem is and giving a solution to it you know uh, so that that is creativity for me and in music uh, it's far more than that because it's a creative art and classical music indian classical music both hindustani as well as carnatic these are both you know extremely creative forms there's a huge scope for manodharma or imagination the part of improvisation uh, therefore when you improvise when you create it's all yours so you are creating that tapestry of raga or you are elaborating on the swaras and you are delving deep into it and you're exploring new avenues each time that you go to the same raga but there is something new to it which comes which stems from within you because you are doing it uh, and that creates a, a very good sense of uh, satisfaction and uh, you know i collaborate with other musicians of different other art forms uh internationally so when different music uh types of music meet and you try to do something together there again that gives me a great sense of uh, satisfaction and happiness in creating something because it's a not that easy it's not very easy to collaborate you can be a good musician but at the same time to collaborate is to create a plus b and create something else afterwards and that requires a lot of other kinds of uh, uh, skills and a different approach to music so all this kind of engagement uh, gives me a lot of happiness it gives me a lot of self satisfaction and therefore it makes me feel good and when you you are happy doing something that you're doing there is a sense of well being because there is something within you that connects both your mind and your body you know that that is fantastic about the performing arts because when you're singing you're exercising your vocal cords and your sound is coming from within if you sing superficially it's not going to create the right kind of sound through therefore you have to bring it from within and uh, our great composer of carnatic music uh, tyagaraja has spoken about this how music travels from within the depths of your body till it becomes a musical sound you see so you're connecting at one level with this external core which is the body it touches your soul because it's it's so very aesthetic there's a creative dimension to it it is very scientific you end up doing a lot of calculations you have to think you have to uh, you know uh, adjust things when you're doing the technical complex parts of music so it's it's a very fascinating amalgam at many levels and that gives you uh uh an aesthetic sense uh, like none other you know and you have that same approach when you when you learn arts you apply it to so many other fields you know uh, whether you you are you buying something or you you're putting up a piece of uh, art in your house or choosing the color of the decor of your house everywhere the sense of aesthetics comes into play and all this i think overall uh, gives me um, a very positive feeling and when finally as a mus- performing musician when it touches uh, your listener positively uh, whether it's a novice listener a layman listener or whether it's a very experienced listener whether it's a listener who's used to this kind of music or it's a completely international audience in that also there are people who are used to your music or used to this genre of music those that are not and when it touches them in a positive way they come back and say this is what i like and you know i love the depth of your voice or i want to go back to this music it's meditative i've heard this several times you know of my music so somewhere it's touching people and you are the medium for that therefore overall there is a lot of sense of well being when you're engaging with something that you like to engage with and in this case we're talking about uh, music so that is for me uh, to the answer to your question i think you've just codified for our listeners what is artful healing and why or how can music be uh, beauty and bring in healing because he's spoken about 
its creativity aspect you've spoken about its sense of mastery and collaboration connection with others that it can nurture and you've also uh, i i don't know if it was something uh, directly said but you've kind of touched upon all the aspects that i have read generally in psychology to be involved in the therapeutic process so i am a little amazed listening to all of that <laughs> may i just add uh, one thing please aditi yes please yes. so when we talk about this therapeutic uh, part of music there is no doubt that uh, there is a therapeutic element in it a book can be very therapeutic when you're feeling down in the dumps and you pick up a book uh, and you know it it up lifts you so music can also lift up your spirits and ragas have rasas to them you know at a very ordinary level you can translate it as uh, like you know uh, feelings uh, that are communicated uh, through the ragas so you know different ragas appeal to different people so when you ask a rasika someone who likes music uh, they will say you know i like this raga very much without being able to say why what but something somewhere there you know appeals to their sensibilities and you have ragas which are very robust and you know convey for example the veera rasa and then uh, you have uh, ragas that could convey uh, you know the shanta rasa that brings in tranquility so uh, there, there is a lot of uh, technical aspects also to it without knowing that also it definitely uh, the performing arts uh, have a therapeutic uh, uh, angle to it and this is something we touched upon in our conversation last month with uh, beena unnikrishnan ji and sonia uh, bhandari both of whom are visual artists working as per, you know uh, presenters of the art form and therapists in the clinical setting and they touched upon something very similar they said that creativity is natural to human beings and art can be a medium of tapping into it or vice versa i want to uh, bring aastha in now and ask her how how she would like to take this forward so as uh, always dr vasumathi just brings up everything all together and uh, like i am really glad to hear you uh, absolutely creativity is something which uh, lies on with everyone and we use it in different places i might drive a vehicle and find it more creative for myself uh, absolutely i may pick up the vegetables and see my creativity into it people say cooking is a creativity people say music listening is as well a creativity because they can absolutely choose for their own selves making a choice is also a bit time uh, need there where it where it fits in is how you can do it can you really make choices for your own self people can make choices but they cannot understand what is happening inside them helping them out is where you really can code or decode them so this is where my interest lies and i feel very good when exactly people get to know what exactly is happening in their head what exactly they can do with all the situations they have around them around in happening in their world everything is happening all around but still they can be wise and good helpful be there that's more important or they can face all the situations that is where my interest lies and i really love when this happens so using all sort of uh, i may not say music at times we chat a lot in the sessions so all sort of creativity and formats when they bring up in the room and decode them and find out a solution to it is what my interest is and that makes me absolutely happy that yes we are done we found out a way to go ahead to about it so uh, what i'm also hearing is that music therapy is maybe using music but in a way of creative problem solving so 
uh, in therapy what what is essentially happening is we are using creativity to solve day to day problems and of an emotional nature and that's where music can come in as a tool and yeah yeah absolutely so right now when we work i am working with children who are undergoing the cancer treatment one day a child comes and tells me i don't want to eat it has nothing to do with a music therapist you don't want to eat you don't want to eat but there is a little thing which brings up okay you love playing free fire let's find out what are the sounds you hear there what uh, excites you what brings you down what is pushing uh, to play it more and more but what is something which is stopping you so let's find out ways and things which you can do right now there are times like there was a 15 days gap where i was not able to be in center and do work with them sitting outside working on zoom you really can say that the music i am giving to you will help you to do ah a child a 5 year old a 4 year old child is not going to listen to you and they are not going to sit with you over the zoom call this is where you can really work upon their creativity and bring them out what exactly is happening with their mind so uh, let's say people say music i say sound so sound is something which you can really work upon through if you really want to do something with your mind so that is where we work upon those little little sounds pick those up find the cues and give them help them to find out the answers to it so we just make them a, a let's say a risk taker to be finding out more solutions to things yeah absolutely and i'm wondering uh, and i'm wondering if you know there is an example of uh, of you know healing through music or uh, music therapy that you you are able to share with our audiences today uh So uh, recently, I was working with a child who is three months old. She is suffering oh. so, uh, from one of a sort of cancer. She has a tumor, and the parents, are, because this this little child is coming from a very underprivileged family, and the parents, the if if I wonder, the the girl who got her here. is herself i think 22 and she is very young and very tiny and very small so there was a study we when i was studying music therapy we studied about the good enough mother that's where my professor once told me are you a good enough uh, music therapist and we used to wonder what are we going to do with this little 3 month old little child and then we thought why not to create a um, relationship in between the mother and the child and there we work upon the improvisation of the sounds of the mother and the child try to connect them so that she can feed better the child can help to uh, get associated with parents better and help to express because even a child cries we get to know whether they are foul, whether these are foul cries or these are original is the child in pain or hunger or need to sleep so these all things are some little things which we introduce to the parents and they get to know that yes these are the ways we can know about our child better now so that's how i think I don't know whether we call it music healing or music therapy or whatever, but this is how I call this as a therapy or a healing or an association. Absolutely, and it it makes a perfect sense. Uh, just the way you articulated that entire experience, and also thank you very much for sharing that with us. Welcome. I want to uh, open the space for both of you to maybe just uh, you know ask each other or share with each other something that uh, you are taking away from this conversation or that's standing out for you. Um, 
Well, what uh, really comes to the fore is that uh, uh, music uh, plays really a large uh, part somewhere in everyone's lives, which I said a little earlier also. Uh, so whatever Asta is doing and uh, the, you know, working with musical sounds uh, in order to bring uh, well-being into other people's lives. So I think naturally music is doing that and we become instruments in order to take it across, you know, to help people, you know, cover that path or cross that bridge. And uh, that is what is important. Uh, what I would also like uh, to say is that people get scared of classical music. That is some sort of a bias that is generated by uh, whatever you listen to in society, partly media, all those things, you know, like uh, uh, negative values that are attached to, for example, eating kitchidi and you say, oh, that is a sick man's diet. Although it's a very nutritious and uh, a low cost and a high powered uh, food. But, you know, then there's this negative tag attached to kitchen that if you're sick, you eat it. So classical music somewhere has, uh, you know, people are uh, uh, scared of it. There's a lot of inhibition. And there is also, it's not meant for everybody. True, it is not the music of the masses. But then there is no reason why you shouldn't try to get closer to it. Because there's an entire cognitive dimension to it when you look at the scientific alignment of the ragas, the swaras, the way your songs are composed, how composers have, uh, uh, you know, dealt with creativity in Carnatic music. Uh, we are, we have uh, a strong repertoire based uh, <coughs> music. There's a huge part of improvisation, no doubt, but there are also a lot of compositions. Uh, different types of compositions like Varnams, Kritis, uh, Padams, Tilanas, etc. And, uh, you know, one single line grows within a composition with little creativity, which we call Sangatis. So it's a scaffolding, little by little, an element of uh, newness is added to it. And, uh, you know, you, it's learned like this by the disciple through the music uh, uh, traditions in which they are honed. <clears throat> Uh, so you see, there is so much of a creativity uh, dimension to it, that aesthetic dimension that you can imbibe. Uh, and then there is the psychological dimension. You're singing, you feel good. And like I said earlier, there is a symbiotic relationship between the body, the mind uh, and the soul. Therefore, the cognitive dimension, the psychological dimensions, the physiological dimensions, everything comes together. So one must, and there's a lot of discipline when you're learning classical music. So uh, I think uh, we should encourage uh, younger kids, music should be introduced, dance also in schools. When I was a kid in school, we had music and there used to be someone playing on the piano and we learned uh, so many songs, you know, and uh, that was the most pleasing part of my uh, weekly uh, schedule for me. And I, if I remember well, the whole bunch of the class, I had never saw anyone unhappy in that music class. Each one was singing, whether they were singing right or they were singing wrong, did not matter at all. But all of them were singing along and, you know, some of them went to try and play the piano. And it was a very, very nice uh, uh, sort of an experience. You know? So uh, I think classical music and music in general uh, should be introduced at the school levels. All children should be encouraged to learn it, some sort of an exposure to that form of music and to understand uh, what its depth is, which will come as you start getting closer to that music. And that is what I would uh, uh, really wish for, so that people think of classical music differently because it's such a great treasure that we have, you know. Absolutely, and uh, I, I'm just in awe of how you are able to beautifully articulate exactly what we are trying to touch into today. And uh, I hope our audiences take this away that classical music is, is not just entertainment. It's about your personality development. It's about your well-being. It's about uh, growth. And it's about, uh, in a way, life itself, right? So it's you're using your body as an instrument uh, and 
you're expressing with your body along with your mind which which is absolutely absolutely uh, precious uh, i want to request you to sing two lines for our audiences please okay uh i will just i put on my uh, tanpura i'll just sing a line now uh, or two of this uh, everyone's favorite song uh, which is krishna ni begne baru it is in kannada and the composer uh, imagines there's a lot of this what we call is vatsalya bhava in the song the feeling of uh, the mother appealing to the child to come and in this case it is krishna and progressively towards the end of the song he becomes uh, god krishna he opens his mouth and the entire universe is with him uh, but this is a child who she calls and cajoles him to come which is a rather popular uh, song and an evergreen favorite in kannada music and many people who do not uh, really uh, are connected much with kannada music also uh, they know the song or they've heard of it uh, or they've listened to it at some point in time so i just sing a line or two of uh, kishani begane this one is in the uh, raga uh, yamuna kalyan mm. कृष्णा including remarks or statements or even you know your experience of being in this conversation with us today and of course listening to dr badrinathan which was an absolute pleasure and honor for me thank you am i still there aditi are you there yeah yeah there so uh if i want to conclude with this i would really want uh everybody to start up with finding out little little things which are happening around them we really talk about volumes because it's it, it is some of a time where we all are at home at times we get some tough times as well i would want you all to consider your volumes and find out whether you are using the right volume to even talk at home if you know what volume you are using you will get to know how you can manage your relationships that's a little tip from a music therapist to all of us 
and let's find out really can a volume make difference in our lives so use your volume appropriately know whether you are using a right sort of volume while you speak okay so that's where i want to conclude up with golden tip i think a lot of us in the pandemic have been uh, you know uh, feeling burdened by interpersonal relationships we are maintaining so much virtually but the burden of all of that is falling on these few people who are with us physically so i think uh, it's definitely going to help our audiences in immensely to just be mindful of the volume that's coming in in the conversation yeah thank you so much it's tricky <laughs> yeah, it, it is very tricky i mean <laughs> yeah but i guess it's just uh, the awareness of that that you're talking about to just be you know checking in with yourself is this the right volume is this the volume i want to be talking <laughs> in yeah golden tip i i am sure our audiences are going to be from it also i wanted to ask asta uh, what would you uh, advise for people who are maybe practicing musicians interested in learning therapy because they might uh, you know have these opportunities where they meet people where they have that experience of imparting healing and interest in doing that or even just budding musicians or music therapists who are listening to us today i think uh, as you are a very good listener your audience is being such such a good listener to us today that's one of a main reason we all are here for i think once you have a listening ears once you understand that listening is as important as using your voice or playing an instrument you will get up, get it and that is the right thing you will get to know where you have to struck it right so use your listening skills and find out for your own self where you are and what really is needed that is the right input that you can give only a listening skill is good enough to be part of the group so i would suggest all the musicians who really want to find out what exactly is happening around them want to be somewhat uh, let's say uh, use their healing skills which music has you really want to do that you start using your listening skills once you use your listening skills you will get the right and appropriate way to help someone else to know where they really want to improve or can give a right input there so that's where it is and professionally if you really want to develop as a music therapist i would say we all believe in culture and we are quite culturally centered people so using culturally centered way of music therapy is one of the most appropriate thing so please do not pull off someone else's music and give your music input into it they don't need that they already have everybody here in india i may say have their own culture music you can use that particular music to find out what exactly is happening and there are too many schools to help you to educate how you really can use that theory so uh, if anybody really wants to talk about it i am available and you are most welcome thank you asta thank you for putting it so simply and uh, beautifully out there uh, dr badri nathan i also want to ask you that there might be people who have uh, interest in learning classical music or you know who are just in little hesitant because you know they might feel like like you said it's kitchery it's uh, it's it's good for when we are sick and they don't know how to take that first step towards learning and practicing uh, how would you guide them or what little piece of advice you have for uh, people who are interested in in the classical music or even uh, who are listening to us today 
and who might feel like oh this talk was so great that i want to sign up for music lessons now classical music lessons. Yeah, first of all, uh, you know, uh, one must uh, shed those inhibitions uh, concerning classical music because uh, this transfers from parents to children and then it goes on, you know, uh, giving a negative etiquette uh, uh, tag, uh, sorry, to it. So uh, as a result of which uh, children are not exposed to it. When I see uh, children growing up with no art form in their life, I, especially families that have access to these things, you know, because you have to be in a privileged position to be able to learn all these things also. So let's not forget that in society. So if you have that capacity, then you must expose your child to uh, uh, some sort of music or dance or, or painting, you know, uh, be it whatever. And that is definitely going to give a tremendous uh, aesthetic uh, perception to their lives and uh, singing, especially, you know, you learn also to modulate your voice and then find your right volume, which Asta spoke about. Uh, that is one. And uh, anybody, uh, you asked me uh, about people who want to get closer to classical music, of course, uh, uh, they, they're free to get in touch with me uh, if in any way I can help them and, uh, you know, uh, give them uh, some kind of inputs that may take them uh, further into classical music and listening and learning. That is... Uh, I would be happy to do so. And uh, everyone doesn't have to become a blossom into a performing musician, you know. You learn for the beauty of learning what you're learning. So that is very, very important. And also the pedagogical approach to music uh, and, uh, you know, our classical arts is sometimes a little very rigorous and uh, it puts away uh, some of the learners. But uh, those who are still very assiduous will get past that stage. So today you have younger teachers who are more innovative and, uh, you know, uh, experiment with uh, uh, different forms of approaches to classical music and, and dance. But all said and done, there's a lot of discipline, there's a lot of rigor involved in it. And I think overall that's very good for a human being at many levels. So uh, anyone that's interested, uh, you know, in touching upon the subject or wishes to engage in a dialogue with me is uh, more than welcome to, to get in touch with me. I'm on Facebook, uh, I'm on uh, Twitter, uh, so one can always reach out to me. I would really like to add here, please don't get scared about discipline. It helps. Somewhere it helps. So if it is making, if you are enrolling your children and finding out that they should be creative in such a manner, please do not be scared about the discipline. It Sometimes a little discipline helps to find out uh, an ethical way to go about any of a subject. And leaving music or any form of art, if not an artist, if somebody else, if any person is becoming anything else and pursuing something else, these all skills are going to help. Let's say these are some sort of life skills as well, at least to articulate and um, speak out what they really want to. So it is good to get ourselves somewhere creative. I think that's a beautiful note to end this conversation on. So it's not about success or fame or the performance of the arts, it is about engaging with the art and engaging in a way that nourishes you, that helps you grow and that that sort of gives you wings to fly with because you are developing skills, you are developing networks, you are developing connection, not just with your own body and mind and spirit, but also with people around you. And I think that's what one needs to have harmony in life for for well-being in life. Uh, thank you so much, Asta, and thank you so much, Dr. Badrinathan, for being here today. I, I wish we could go on. Uh, maybe we should do another conversation soon. I would love that. Thank you very much, <laughs> uh, Aditi, uh, uh, for inviting me, and uh, Asta for being uh, uh, such a wonderful co-panelist uh, and I thank uh, Wiki Arts Council for inviting me to uh, partake of this discussion. Thank you. It was a really nice experience uh, discussing with both of you.
Thank you, ladies. It was wonderful joining in and finding out new things about music and culture and arts. I also want to thank uh, our soul sisters at Wiki Arts Leadership Council for helping us go live and coordinate this entire series. We will be meeting again next month, decoding a different art form with an artist and an art therapist. Please stay tuned. Thank you so much. Uh, there's some technical issue. We are going to stop the live stream. Thank you so much, Asta. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajnathan. Wishing you good luck. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So we sign off here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank yes. you. Bye. Bye. Okay.